Good morning, everyone. Uh, good afternoon for one, maybe for Isamar, our, our speaker today. So it's my pleasure to introduce you, Isamar Cortez. She is currently pursuing her doctoral degree in environmental science and management at Montclair State University. Her research studies are focused on exploring the effects of climate conditions on mangrove island systems across the Caribbean. In 2019, Isamar was awarded uh, a fellowship from NASA to develop numerical modeling tools and couple them with different types of remote sensing data as LiDAR and optical to quantify high, how climate change is affecting soil stressors concentrations in mangrove soils. Additionally, Isamar also co-directs the Code to Communicate program, whose mission is to foster a positive space for participants to learn open source programming and effective science communication skills in both English and Spanish. In this program, she directs the coding portion, teaching people coding skills in both ancient and Spanish. Isamar is in the final year of her PhD and looks forward to forming collaborations as she continues in her scientific career. So Isamar, thank you very much for coming here. And yeah, the floor is yours. Perfect. Uh, let me share my screen and I will get started. All right, thank you all for coming to my talk. Um, so today's talk, I'm gonna be talking specifically about the role of climate conditions on mangrove island systems across the Caribbean. And I'll explain a little bit what mangrove islands are within the next few slides. But basically the outline for this presentation is we're going to start off with a macro scale analysis, which is going to be exploring the entire Caribbean followed by a micro scale analysis where we're only going to be looking at three regions in the Caribbean, specifically two in Florida and then one in Puerto Rico. And finally, we're gonna be talking about some exciting possibilities in the realm of coupling numerical modeling systems with remote sensing analysis, which will be an exciting portion of this talk today. And so just to introduce a little bit of my research area, my study site, I'm specifically looking at mangrove ecosystems and mangroves are a halophytic species of tree that reside in tropical and subtropical regions. Halophytic just meaning salt tolerant, which means that they're able to thrive within environments where there is high salinity concentrations such as ocean salinity. So they are technically considered the trees of the sea because they can grow within coastal intertidal regions. And so because of that, they do offer several beneficial ecosystem services, such as coastal protection, blue carbon storage, and habitat for thousands of species. And so what I'm specifically exploring is how, what is the role of climate conditions on mangrove ecosystems? How are climate conditions playing within salinity concentration values? And how is that going to be detrimental to mangroves in the future? And so this talk is really geared towards that connection between climate conditions and mangrove ecosystems. And so mangroves, as I explained, are across the globe in tropical and subtropical regions. So they are of one of the most, of most important um, ecosystems that we really need to explore and understand. But I'm specifically focusing my study site in the Caribbean for now. Um, and I will explain in the next few slides how this research can actually be globalized and what the next steps would be for this work. And so just to give you guys a brief intro on mangrove islands, mangrove islands are isolated remote island systems that are primarily composed of mangroves, which is what you see in panel B and C. And so you'll find these really remote mangrove islands within bay environments, within open ocean environments, but they are remote, they, they're isolated, very hard to get to. And so satellite imagery actually provides a really good opportunity for understanding and studying all of these systems that are normally a little bit more challenging to get to. And so for my macro scale work, I am looking at seven different regions across the Caribbean, which you can see highlighted in panel A. And so 
what I do is develop a numerical modeling framework and then couple that with satellite imagery analysis. And so a numerical modeling process-based framework basically explains, okay, you've got this system and how can we quantify this system with source terms, for example? So I have developed a linear diffusion model that explores the changes in the salinity concentration, which is what you're seeing here. And although mangroves are halophytic, meaning that they can live in salt water, at a certain salinity concentration threshold, they begin to die back, which is what you're seeing in these threshold lines right here. And in that center region, you're seeing dieback within that island. And so just to look at this model output versus the actual island itself, you can see that the dieback is within that center region. And so using this linear diffusion model, we're able to quantify how evaporation and precipitation rates, which is my source term here, can affect the salinity concentration within the mangrove islands. And so um, by deriving this numerical modeling framework further, we're able to come up with a quadratic function, which is my one-dimensional modeling framework. And so this 1D equation is able to give us the salinity concentration profile across a transect within a mangrove island system. And that's gonna be really important because we will also be exploring two dimensions later in this talk. And so further deriving that modeling framework, we can also quantify the vegetated area as a function of the net evaporation rates, the dispersion coefficient, and the outer edge salinity concentration value. And I'll explain a little bit in the next slide. Second, there we go. In the next slide, how all of these different components, these ingredients work together within my modeling framework to really quantify and capture what the extent or effect of climate conditions are within a mangrove island system. And so in this modeling framework, you've got a reference island, for example, in panel A, right? This is your standard island. You've got mangroves in the exterior, dieback in the interior, but as you increase the net evaporation rates and the net evaporation being the evaporation rate minus the precipitation rate. So as you increase the evaporation rate, you're going to increase the salinity concentration within a mangrove island system because you're decreasing the freshwater availability within that island system. Again, these islands, very much remote. So the only real freshwater input that you'll see is from precipitation, right? So positive E net is going to equal increases in evaporation as, with respect to precipitation. And so you'll get dieback within the interior from that where you have dieback expansion. With the dispersion coefficient though, you're going to see a reduction in that mangrove area where the dieback contracts because you're going to have a flow of water through the soil um, and that allows for the soil salinity to decrease in terms of the concentration. And so those reductions in concentration are going to equal increases in that mangrove area within the center point of that island. And with the outer edge salinity, this one's important and I'll talk a little bit about it during my talk, but I don't touch on it too much. But just to give you guys some background with the outer edge salinity, it really depends on where your bay is, your island is located, whether it's in a bay system or open ocean environment, because open ocean environments tend to have outer edge salinity concentrations around 35 parts per thousand as standard. But if you're in an enclosed bay environment where there's less flushing from the exterior ocean salinity towards the interior of the bay, you're gonna have higher increases in that outer edge salinity. And we'll touch on that in terms of Florida Bay in the next few slides. And so now I've got all of these ingredients. Now I actually have to use some data to quantify all of these different ingredients in my modeling framework. So to quantify the net evaporation rates, again, net evaporation being the evaporation rate minus the precipitation rate, we're going to be using the Tropical Rain Monitoring Mission, which um, is a satellite uh, mission, which is between NASA and JAXA, if I'm not mistaken. And we're using data from 1998 till 2019, but that also includes GPM data. And so what I'm looking at is, okay, I've got this entire Caribbean for precipitation data. I want to get the average data for every single point within the Caribbean that I'm specifically studying. And so to do that, I grab all of the precipitation data from the Tropical Rain Monitoring Mission, average it all to have an average precipitation map that shows you on average the precipitation rates for the past 20 something years. I do the same thing for evaporation. So evaprotion data I grab from the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute's OA Flux project that they have 
modeled ev ocean evaporation rates from 1956 till present. But to create a net evaporation map, which is what I want to create for this analysis, I have to use overlapping years with the tropical rain monitoring mission and GPM. And so another step that I have to take for this analysis is down or not downscaling, but resampling is the term that I'm looking for. And so the trim data, for example, is at 0.25 degree resolution versus the HUI data that's at one degree resolution. So resampling allows me to convert the trim 0.25 to a one degree. So that way I'm comparing apples to apples to create this net evaporation rates map. And so this shows on average the net evaporation rates across the Caribbean from 1998 till 2019. And as you can see, there's a lot of variability in the Caribbean, um, which is really interesting when studying it, because then you have a sense of, okay, if you're in Belize versus Florida, you might see more dieback in islands in Florida as opposed to Belize that has a lower net evaporation rate. So let's look at some examples of different islands. Here, you're seeing four different examples of islands. In terms of net evaporation rates, here you're seeing four different islands across the Caribbean, and you're seeing that they're all in positive net evaporation regions. But what's interesting is that Florida that has the highest net evaporation region, you have one of the highest, the largest areas of dieback within that island comparatively to the other three. So that begs the question, okay, net evaporation rate is a determinant of dieback, but it's not the only determinant. We also have to look at the dispersion coefficient. And so the dispersion coefficient is really interesting because normally when you quantify or when you grab data for the dispersion coefficient, you actually have to go out into the field and quantify this data through field work analysis. But I'm looking at 29 islands across the Caribbean, across many different countries. So I can't physically do that, but what I can do is use satellite imagery analysis to try to quantify it. And so the way that we quantify the dispersion coefficient is based on the area of red mangroves. And so your dark green, for example, is your red mangrove, your lighter green is your black mangrove. And the reason why we use the area of red mangroves is because red mangroves are the least salt tolerant species in the Caribbean, followed by black mangroves. In the Caribbean, you've got four species of mangroves. So you've got red, black, white, and buttonwood. But white and buttonwood prefer areas of latitude. And so we're I'm specifically focusing on the interplay between red and black. Black being higher saline tolerant, red being less saline tolerant. And so you can assume that, for example, in panel C, if you have a high um, area of red mangroves, you're going to see increases in the dispersion coefficient because you've got that decrease in the salinity concentration profile. So to quantify the area of red mangrove without actually going to the field, I use a near infrared classification technique. And so the idea behind this classification technique is that red mangroves have more chlorophyll content in their leaves as opposed to black mangroves because black mangroves are less stressed. And this has been um, a method that's been used in the past to try to distinguish between mangrove species. And so because red mangroves have more chlorophyll content, chlorophyll doesn't necessarily use near infrared light. And so you'll get more reflective reflectance in the, in, in the near infrared space. Um, and so based on that, you're able to distinguish between red and black mangroves. And here I use a random forest classifier to classify between red and black mangroves and grab the red mangrove area for each one of these um, islands. So I was explaining a little bit about the outer edge salinity and the way I categorize the outer edge salinity is through literature reviews and also through whether the outer edge the island that I'm looking at is within a bay environment or an open ocean environment. And so using that equation that I showed you previously to calculate the vegetated area from my modeling framework, I compare that to the actual vegetated area to find that my model does a pretty good job in terms of quantifying the vegetated area as a function of the outer edge salinity, dispersion coefficient, and net evaporation rates, those three ingredients, those three key ingredients that I'm going to need um, to quantify the vegetated area. Granted, Florida is an interesting case because it's does have, so Florida Bay is also known as Thousand Islands because it does have a lot of mangrove islands. 
But depending on where those islands are located within the bay, you're going to see differences, vast differences in the vegetated area. And I'll be talking a little bit more about that within the next few slides. And so we've already talked about the vegetated area per se of the islands, but what about tree structure? What about canopy height? Um, we'll get into that a little bit. So in this last portion for the macro scale work, I also looked at the future projections using three different climate models which again, this model is very much data driven. So there's going to be a lot of moving components in terms of what data I use for what. And so what we're seeing here is that across the Caribbean, across all three SSP scenarios, you're going to be seeing a reduction, a percent reduction in the mangrove vegetated area for all of these regions. The only region where there's a bit of percent gain and barely anything is Cuba for SSP 2.6 but that's not the most likely SSP scenario that we are currently headed in. So now let's talk a little bit about tree structure and canopy height. So I've used my 1D model to explore the changes in vegetated area or not changes, but the, the differences in vegetated area based on a spatial scale across the Caribbean, but now we're going to look at canopy heights. And so the way we're doing that is with LIDAR data. And so the idea here is using the 1D model again, but in a different context. So as you increase the salinity concentration, as you saw in those curves that we talked about previously, you're going to see a reduction in the canopy height going towards the interior. And so that's partly due to the fact that increases in the salinity concentration equate to those decreases in canopy height. And that's been previously studied um, in other literature that I will be referencing some figures from within the next few slides. And the first thing that we do is grab this LIDAR data from Goddard's light, um, LIDAR thermal and, and hyperspectral imager. If I said that right, I'm pretty sure I did. And so their LiDAR data has one meter resolution, which is really fantastic for the very small islands that I'm looking at. And so you can actually see one island here. This is one of the islands that I'm studying in Puerto Rico that you'll see a lot of um, within the next few slides as well. And the LiDAR data, what I basically do with it is first collect all of the LiDAR data available in the Caribbean for the Caribbean mangrove islands that I'm looking at. And these are the three regions that I have LiDAR data for, but what's really cool about these three regions is that not only, not only can I say that, okay, these are the regions that I'm studying because this is the only region that I have G-Light data for, but also because all these three regions are in vastly different environmental, external environmental factors. Um, so for example, two of these regions, the islands are all in bay environments. So you're going to have an increase in that outer edge salinity as opposed to uh, Western Florida, where Western Florida is all within open ocean. So you're going to have more flushing of that salinity from the exterior towards the interior of the island. There will be a little bit more flushing action happening there through intertidal processes, right? And so each one of these regions has something really unique and special about them. Um, so studying them, I will show you within the next few slides, there are key differences between the regions in terms of canopy heights, which is really interesting. So as I mentioned before, there have been other papers that have looked at canopy height as a function of salinity. And I, again, brought my one dimensional modeling framework into this slide just to show you guys, okay, in the first part of my talk, I explained how I'm using my one dimensional model to explore the vegetated area across a large spatial scale. And now I'm using the same modeling framework to explore the relationship between canopy height and salinity across these regions in, across these three regions in the Caribbean. So to quantify this um, relationship, first I derive the canopy height models from the LIDAR data. And so the canopy height models just basically show the tall the tallest trees across that entire island, which is what you're seeing here. Then I also need to explore the distance to water for every single one of these trees. And so that's going to be important, right? Because what I'm saying is that as you go towards the interior of the island, you're going to see a reduction in mangrove canopy height. So I have to know 
for every single point within my canopy height model, how far is that from the edge of the island? And so then I can correlate the two, which is what I'm doing here. The canopy height model versus the distance to water. And so you're seeing that reduction in canopy height as you go towards the interior of the island. And finally, using the methodology from the first part of the talk, which is grabbing the red mangrove area, the net evaporation rates, and the outer edge salinity, I can quantify the salinity concentration profile for each one of these islands, which is what you're seeing here, and then relate that to the distance to water. And the reason why I relate salinity to distance to water first, so as you go towards the interior of the island, you're going to be increasing in the salinity concentration. The reason why I relate the two first is because I want to finalize and relate salinity to the canopy height model. And that's why I go from distance to water and distance to water to canopy height model and salinity. And so what you're seeing here are preliminary results where I explore the salinity concentration, um, the canopy heights as a function of the salinity concentration for all three regions, right? So again, um, the geolite data is really great because it's high resolution one meter. Um, LiDAR data. The only thing with the GLite data, though, is that it doesn't have a lot of coverage for a lot of different islands that I'm looking at. So each one of these regions is going to have more islands or it's going to have less islands. It's not all going to be covered, right? And so with Florida Bay, I currently have coverage for three islands, which is great because I can still do this analysis to compare, but I will have more islands for Western Florida versus Puerto Rico. And so Florida Bay is really interesting. And I've mentioned that previously in the talk, but the reason why it's interesting is because the depending on where you are in the bay, you're going to experience higher outer edge salinity concentrations. And that higher outer edge salinity, as I show, I've shown you previously, can equate to decreases in that um, both canopy heights and decreases in the vegetated area, right? And so these three islands are located within a transect in Florida Bay where this island, for example, is all the way closer to the northeastern edge, which has higher outer edge salinity concentration, as opposed to this island, which is closer to the north or southwestern edge, where there is more flushing between ocean salinity versus bay salinity. And so that's really interesting. Um, all of the Puerto Rico islands are located within the same bay environment. And again, these are preliminary results. So I am still working with the LIDAR data to enhance the quality of these results. And then Western Florida is also really interesting because it keeps a very similar, um, it keeps a very similar canopy height across the islands. And so I'm exploring that a little bit more to see what's going on with the LIDAR data there. But it's also interesting to note that the islands in Western Florida, in terms of species donation, don't act the same as the islands in Puerto Rico and Florida Bay, where red mangroves are in the exterior and black mangroves are in the interior. I've actually found a switch or an opposite where you find black mangroves more so on the exterior and red mangroves on the interior. So I am exploring Western Florida a little bit more or Florida Keys as we call it. Um, I just have it as Western Florida for the purposes of my work. And so we've been talking a lot about one dimensional island modeling, um, but now I'm gonna show you a little bit going even more micro scale into a two dimensional island modeling framework. And so this is actually work that I did at CSCMS while I was there in the summer. So I was at CU Boulder and I did do a lot of this work there. And I will be presenting updates on this work at AGU in a few months. So if you guys are interested, I will be giving an oral presentation there as well, but I will be giving you a teaser trailer on this work now. So as I mentioned, this past summer, I was at CU Boulder working at CSCMS um, using their Land Lab Python library, which is amazing, by the way, um, to build my two-dimensional modeling framework. And so the reason why the two-dimensional modeling framework is interesting and it's a great next step to take with this analysis is because for my previous one-dimensional model, I've been assuming that all of the islands are circular. As you've seen in different iterations of my figures, those islands are circular. I have been assuming circular islands. Here, I don't have to assume with the geometry, which means that I can quantify the salinity concentration across 
completely different spaces in terms of the geometry to see where dieback actually forms within this um, within these island systems and compare it to the satellite imagery that shows where the dieback actually is, which is really exciting stuff, right? And so I am working on this two-dimensional island model. And with this model, what I'm trying to do is, okay, I've got these two islands right here. These are the two that I'm gonna show you some results on. And they are very much irregular shaped islands. They are not entirely circular. You can argue that maybe they can be circular, but these islands are really interesting as well because they're within a bay environment, but there is some shielding going on where you've got this island right here that's got a ton of dieback in the, ex in the interior. And you've got this island right in front of it that meets the bay mouth, right? And so waves that will go through this first island will be dampened and don't actually flush to, uh, don't actually flush to the back towards the second island, right? So what I'm exploring is, okay, I've got these two islands, one island that has a lot of dieback within the interior, another one that does not. So how do we explore this? How do we quantify this? So the first thing I did was, again, with LandLab's linear diffuser component, which is amazing, um, I was able to develop a this two-dimensional modeling framework. And just to give some more background, mangroves begin to die back in the Caribbean after about 100 parts per thousand. So I had to set that threshold. Basically, in my model, I said, okay, if the salinity concentration, because right, right now what you're seeing in this um, in this modeling framework or in this model run, I'll call it a model run, you're seeing dieback within the interior, and that dieback is set to set to 100 parts per thousand. So after the salinity concentration, which all of this that you're seeing here is salinity concentration, after the salinity concentration increases past 100 parts per thousand, basically nan it out and show me where the dieback is forming, right? But I had to set boundary conditions. And so a boundary condition just basically means, okay, what is your starting salinity value at the edge, at all of the edges of your island? For me, for this first model run, I set it to 35 parts per thousand. And the reason being, I wanted to start playing with the model and see exactly how the island develops based on a salinity, outer edge salinity concentration value of 35 parts per thousand. So this first model run shows that there is dieback within the interior where it's very similar to the actual island itself where you see the dieback as well forming within this interior region. But the dieback that you're seeing within this island is a little bit more shifted towards the north side, which is closer, farther away from the, from the bay mouth, because these all of these islands are in the south of Puerto Rico within a bay environment. And so I wanted to continue to play with it and see, okay, I've got this dieback with Indian here, but it's more so centered. Is there a way that I can actually maybe increase the boundary condition within one side to see if I can shift the dieback? And there is. So this um, this model run that you're seeing here is actually that. It's the shift within the dieback more so towards um, the side that has higher outer edge salinity. So I basically took half of my grid and increase the outer edge salinity to 50 parts per thousand. And so that's what you're seeing is those shifts. So now I'm starting to get similar results in terms of comparing it to satellite imagery analysis, which um, is a really fun experience in terms of exploring numerical modeling frameworks and coupling them with satellite imagery to see if what I'm modeling can actually exist within these um, satellite imagery spaces, right? So then we look at the back bay modeled island. And so with this back bay modeled island, as I was explaining before, the island in the most southern tip, which is closer to the actual bay mouth, is going to have a lot more waves going through it and whatnot, and it's going to dampen the wave effect. So I did the same analysis with this island specifically, and I set the outer edge salinity concentration to 35 parts per thousand to start. Now, this white line that you're seeing here, I didn't explain that yet, but what that is, it's the ecotonal region between red and black mangroves. So red mangroves start to die back at around 72 parts per thousand, and black mangroves die back around 100 parts per thousand. 
And so that's important to note because it allows me to basically explore, okay, where are my red mangroves within my modeling space? And then compare that to satellite imagery analysis and see if my model actually does a good job of capturing where those red mangroves exist within this 2D space, right? So then I increase the outer salinity. Now I did dramatically increase it. And this work is a is work in progress, which you will see updates on for all of those who are going to AGU this year, if you guys want to come to my talk. Um, I did increase the outer edge salinity here to around 70-ish parts per thousand just to see what would happen, but I also decreased the dispersion coefficient, which is part of the linear diffuser component. And so by doing that, I do see, I do find that in this 2D space modeling, I'm able to capture some of the mechanisms that are going on in terms of dieback towards the interior of these islands. And then I can basically use these parameters or use what I've learned from the model to see if that's actually captured within, with, within satellite imagery, which is the next step. So in terms of exciting possibilities, there's a lot of exciting possibilities that we can talk about with respect to taking numerical modeling frameworks and coupling them with satellite imagery analysis. And so what you're seeing here is a Landsat time-lapse that I've built from 1985 to present of an island in Cuba, but you see that expansion of dieback towards the interior. And so just exploring that expansion and contraction in dieback within the satellite record and seeing if we can quantify that is a really cool first step, but also globalizing um, the model, although that will take a lot of different environmental parameters that I would have to add because mangrove islands in Florida, or not in Florida, but in the Caribbean, don't behave the same as mangrove islands within, for example, Asia. Um, and so, yes, those differences, we can definitely explore different types of modeling frameworks and whatnot. And thank you. If you guys have any questions, I know I've got about 10 minutes left. So if you guys have any questions, comments, or concerns, or feedback, I'll take it all. And I left my contact information up there too. Yep, Elsa. Um, hi. Hi. Thanks for the great talk. Um, I'm I'm curious. Do you? Um, I'm curious if these islands have, um. I, I guess I'm curious about the three-dimensional model just because I know from like the kind of um, computational fluid dynamics perspective, like the different different the different densities of like different salt water can like have um, really important impacts on the flow. Um, and so I'm curious if there is a lot of topographic difference on, of between these islands and whether you think that would um, have an effect on your results as well. Oh, that's a very good question. So I have looked at the digital elevation models for all of these islands and have found that on maximum in terms of topographic elevation, we're at four meters. So I did try to choose these islands as well because they're low lying. Because otherwise you're right, I would have the problem if I wanted to apply this model to coastal regions, um, I would have to include a term for the topographic elevation. So yes. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, yeah, it did. Um, yeah, so super cool. Cool, thank you. Uh, Sophie? Hey. Hey. Um, <clears throat> great talk. Uh, I was wondering, so all of your modeling was on mangrove islands. But I know that mangroves also help um, stabilize the shore in like, I, you know, like bigger islands. Does your work on dieback and salinity also apply there or um, is it sort of a different situation? Oh, that's such a good question. Okay. So in terms of, you're asking about coastal mangrove regions, my work could potentially apply there, but I would have to add some other parameters for hydrodynamics. Because if you go, for example, 
again, I know I'm using Puerto Rico a lot, but I know a lot about it. So I'm going to use that system. Um, in Southern Puerto Rico, within the actual mainland, you have a lot of regions that have mangroves within along the coastline, but then right behind that coastline, you have a lot of dieback, right? And so that could also be attributed to pollution from run from runoff that is from nearby factories or nearby agricultural centers. Um, so my work can potentially be attributed, but I would probably need to include other parameters. Cool. I hope that answers the question. Let me know if I didn't answer it though. No, that's great, thanks. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, uh, Phil, you have a good question. Uh, I'm reading his question in the chat. To what degree are databases for your research available to expand your research to other continents across the globe? That's a really good question. So the reason why I haven't expanded my research across the globe is because of other global, uh, other environmental parameters that I don't account for in my model. My model is um, very much a simplified linear diffusion model that works specifically for the Caribbean for now, because a lot of the other regions across the globe. So for example, um, let me see if I can actually go back. Mm, so for example, okay. So these maps right here, these maps are actually global. I just zoomed into the Caribbean for the purposes of this talk, but I do have a global version of this net evaporation map. The problem being right now with my modeling framework is that I only look at regions that are in positive net evaporation zones. So where evaporation is greater than precipitation. Um, right now, my modeling framework assumes that if you use a negative net evaporation region, which a lot of the regions, for example, again, in Asia, are, um, or in northern, north, northeast Australia, I think, um, they, my model would assume that mangroves just continue to grow because I don't have a breaking point within my modeling framework. And so that's not that that doesn't happen in obviously in the grow in the globe, right? And mangroves don't just continue to grow out. They eventually have a stopping point, which is the carbonate platform just stops and they can't grow because it's too deep to grow past that carbonate platform point. Um, but yes, there are a lot of different databases slash satellite imagery that can be used to explore this question further in other regions that aren't the Caribbean. I would just have to probably extend my model to account for those regions. Good postdoc question though. Very clear, thank you. Of course. Any other questions? Hi, Zamar, Sibeli uh, here. So thank you. I really appreciate your talk um, and understand a little bit more of your work. Uh, yeah, I was I was going to ask you about like how to automatize your models. I see that you have different salinities across the region, and yeah, we know how they affect. Uh, and you talk a little about a little bit about now about like this global difference, but for the region, do you see a way of like automatizing your two D model? uh for applying to the other islands that you are not studying in deep so a way a way that you can because i'm thinking about like how can you get a tree short for this uh salinity and and have a like a regional model uh and for example you could use other satellite-based data for comparison, for example, GDI or hyperspectral for species. So how do you see like your model going forward in terms of like having a regional temporal model for the, re for, for the Caribbean, for example, with all those technologies and you, what you are doing, so. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I think I'll answer that in a few parts. So in terms of my two-dimensional model, which is what you 
started asking about and just let me know Sibeli if I didn't pick on all of your points mm -hmm. but this model is really nice because all I'm feeding into it I basically convert all of these islands I turn them into shape files if the shape files don't already exist right and then I convert those shape files into rasters, which then I can feed into a uh, land lab raster model grid, which is really, really nice, right? And so as long as I have all of the shape files for all of the different islands, I can theoretically do this analysis for as many islands as I want. So that's one way to automatize it, is to just have the shape files because I've already got code that turns the shape file to a raster and then imports that into the raster model grid in, um, in land lab. So that's one way to automatize it a little bit, as long as I have that data available. And in terms of the hyperspectral data, yeah, um, it's really exciting that there is so much data out there available that can be used. Because right now you're right, I do use multispectral data for the species classification, um, but hyperspectral would definitely be better because it would pick up a lot better in terms of differences in spectral signatures between different species. And so, Hyperspectral would be better to use in regions where there are more than four species of mangrove, which is pretty much the rest of the world, as opposed to the Caribbean. Um, and that would probably be a next step if I wanted to extend this modeling framework further, is explore the explore better, not better data, I won't say better data, but explore data that better suits other regions across the globe. So it can be globalized, but it has to be thought really well in terms of what the question is, what and what data would best serve to answer that question. Did I answer your question, Sibeli? Yes, yes. I'm just like, yeah, I want to use your model. <laughs> so can, uh, if we do not have more questions, I don't know if you have in the chat or here. Uh, or after that, if we have, I'd like to open a space and I'd like actually to hear from you about your project with teaching, training, uh, open science, like uh, programming for in Spanish and in English, how it is. So we'd like to understand a little, a little bit more about this project as well. If we do not have more questions regarding your research. And thank you again. Absolutely. Yeah, I can give an overview on some of the work I've done in terms of coding in Spanish. If no one else has any other questions on my list. Okay. Oh. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of, you're asking Sibeli about the Code to Communicate program. And that was a project that I started working on a few years ago where I developed a lot of the training material in um, introductory Python training material in English and Spanish. And the purpose of doing that was to remove the language barrier that sometimes exists for international students, specifically from um, Spanish speaking countries, when they come and they learn how to code and that's already hard <laughs> itself to begin with. So creating material in two languages really helps solidify not just, okay, this is how I'm learning um, this material in my native language, but this is how I would learn it in a classroom in English, for example. Um, and so I've been working on that for two years. I it, We're working on trying to run it again this year. So hold off on that. I will let you all know if the program runs this year or not. Um, and so, yeah, it's really exciting. I, I don't know if you have any questions on that, actually. I'm not sure what else, what, what to talk about in terms of the program. Yeah, actually, if you want to share with us, like, I don't know, any links that you have, something that we can learn a bit, a little bit more about this project would be great in terms, yeah, it's pretty related to what we do here at AirFlab and ESO now. So maybe we can exchange more about that. Yeah, absolutely. I can send I can send you the link to the website. Um, we are currently accepting applications, so be on the lookout for that. But I will send you I will send you and Casey the link. Oh, thank you. Absolutely. Right. 
Okay, so thank you very much for coming. Pretty interesting. And yeah, I guess we appreciate a little, uh, we appreciate a lot your talk. Thank you. Yeah, of course. And there's my contact info. Um, you guys have my email and Twitter. So reach out if you need anything. And I will be at AGU giving another talk. So I will see at some of you at AGU. Probably will be there. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.